Let's change things around. Good morning, sir. Good afternoon. Good morning, Mr. Bob. I gotta fix this. Yeah, let me fix this. All right, let's do this. This. That's Alexa, turn off office light. There we go. That's good enough. Okay. So hello, everybody. Sorry, I'm, I'm not late, but a little disorganized. Um, everybody's okay? Yes, everything. Yes, sir. It's good. Okay. Well, we already have um, nine people, so that's good enough to start. So let's open in prayer. Uh, Lord, I thank you. Oh, my heart, I thank you, Lord God, that you are opposed to the proud. Give grace to the humble. I pray that you would work this day in this very difficult discussion that we're going to have, that you would be glorified in all we discuss in Jesus' name. I pray that you'll minister to people and encourage people for your glory. And I just commit all that we're going to discuss to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'm just going to warn you. My daughter has two cats, and I'm at my daughter's desk. My daughter is, in, is, is on a, a holiday with her children and husband. And so because they're gone, the cats, and this is my daughter's desk, the cats are coming here. So they are going to try to knock over the camera. They're going to try to jump on my lap. Um, I don't know what they're going to do. It's just to understand this. Yesterday... They were terrorizing me. They were just like Taliban. They were just like taking over everything. Ah, he left. Okay, or she left, I should say. Okay. So let's see, we've got seven, 10 people. Cool, that's good. All right. So I'm gonna jump into a very difficult lesson I don't know if we're gonna have discussion. I'm, we'll see. We'll see if we have discussion or not. So uh, we'll come to here. You, you can't do a biblical theology on church ministry without doing a section on church discipline. It just, it's just really big. So what we're going to do is talk about church discipline, what it is, um, how important it is, how it would be carried out. And I guess we're going to have lots of discussion about this because I don't know how we can get away with this without having lots of discussion. So let's start. Okay, so we have five. I mean, Chris, I've changed the questions. I've changed the questions to fit our new our new. Um, outline of what we're doing. Uh, what should be the way of reaching those goals in church ministry? That's where we are now. We're in this, this now third question. <sighs> so even though we're doing Pauline theology, we have to start with Jesus in this. And so um, rather than me explaining what church discipline is, because I may not be a familiar phrase it might not be familiar i'm going to show you what it is by looking at jesus's teaching so jesus says if your brother sins 
go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. That's a quote from the Old Testament. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a tax, as a Gentile and a tax collector. So here are the steps the Lord Jesus gave us to follow if our brother sins. Show him his fault in private. If he does not listen, take two or, two or three more, not two or two, two or three more with you. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or tax collector. And Jesus is saying here that he'll be somebody you don't associate with anymore. Okay, so it's somebody that you're, that it doesn't matter who it is, doesn't matter whose family this person's from. Um, if they sin, if, and if they, it's, a, it's a habitual sin, it's not a sin that, that's done one time. Because if it's, done, if it's a sin that's done one time, when you go to that person privately, they're going to listen to you. It's a sin that the person is doing and is not stopping from. So I'm going to give you an example in real life. When I was a pastor, no, no, no. When I was an elder, um, I could do a pastor too, but when I was an elder, uh, one of my good friends, his wife came, to, uh, how did that work? He moved out from his wife. They had, I guess, four children. And he moved out. And um, it's like, what? So I went and talked to him about it. And, and um, it's like, what are you doing? And he says, well, you know, my wife, she's just really violent and she's really this. And I was like, okay. And I kind of listened to him. I'd be honest, I'm ashamed. But his wife said that he had a, another woman. And um, so as time went on, we were like, well, what do we do? We met with this guy on a regular basis. And he said, oh, there's nobody else. No, there's nobody else. And then it turned out there was. He was committing sexual immorality. And he didn't repent from it. He didn't repent. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's happened now. So his wife, and I mean, his wife caught him um, staying overnight with this woman that he, he was having this relationship with. And um, she caught him doing it and proved it. And the church disciplined him and removed him from the fellowship. We, we went to him privately. The pastor and I went to him together. Then we ended up announcing it to the church. It was a heartbreak. It was horrible and, and just, just a heartbreaking situation. Um, I've been involved with this kind of a situation <sighs> several times, too many times. And um, that's what we mean by church discipline. You go to them privately first, then you go to them with somebody else and two or three people, and then you tell it to the church. And if you still refuse to repent, it's over. So this is not a one-time sin because a one-time sin, I mean, you go to the person privately and the person stops the sin, like David and Bathsheba. This would be like going to David and saying, David, you've got to stop this sin. And David saying, no, I'm not going to stop it. I'm the king. I can do whatever I want, which certainly happened in the book of Kings. That happened a lot. So it's not like that's unusual. Uh, I'm certain that, God sent prophets to Solomon. I'm sure that God sent pro prophets to Solomon. Solomon sure didn't listen. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, certainly didn't listen. Um, and we know that God sent prophets to Ahaz and Ahab. They didn't listen. So we're talking about what to do when someone doesn't listen. Not like David, who did listen. There's no point in, in disciplining David. Well, yes, there is, but we'll, I don't have, that's not. We'll need to talk about that at the end of this. We'll definitely need to talk about that. So 
in this passage we just looked at, the very next verse is talking about binding and loosing. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind in heaven, or I'm sorry, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Extremely interesting Greek construction, Greek students. Really interesting. Whatever you bind on earth, present, or it might be Aristotle now, shall have been bound in heaven. It's a future perfect. It's a paraphrastic phrase. A future perfect. Yeah, really, seriously. So perfect has this idea of something which is accomplished, which something which is done in the past, which continues to have an effect in the future. So here, um, it's 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 paraphrastic, and so the way the way it's put together, it's something that's happened and will continue to have an effect on the future. When did it happen? Well, it happened in the future, but then from then on, it has an impact on the future. All right, perfect is really a super, super interesting um, aspect. Okay, so anyway, so whatever, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. <coughs> for two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am, or I am there in their midst. Now, we, we usually quote this as if this is about church fellowship. No, this is about church discipline. This is about church discipline, which is super interesting. This is not about demons. It's about church discipline. Whatever this difficult passage means, and it is really difficult. I, I spent quite a bit of time last night uh, with D.A. Carson's commentary in Matthew, which is an awesome concert, a co commentary. And... <laughs> It's really difficult. It's a really difficult thing. But this much is clear. God himself expects us to loose a person from the church. That's what we mean by loosing. That that person is loosed from the church, so they are no longer attached to the church when they refuse to repent. And the key is refusing to repent. If they, if they repent, there's no problem. It's, it's done. Bust. But if they refuse to repent, that's what we're dealing with here. Okay. When believers correctly discipline um, an unrepentant brother, God supports it. So whatever else shall have been bound in heaven means, and lots of controversy about what it means, difficult to understand, but whatever it means, it means this much, that when the church disciplines someone who refuses to repent from sin, it's a serious sin, when, when the church disciplines someone who refuses to repent and disciplining meaning they remove them from the church. First, they go to them privately. Then they go with two or three witnesses. Then they bring it to the church and say, this is the problem we're having. And if the person refuses to repent, then that person is loosed from the church. That person is, is no longer bound to the church. That person no longer belongs to the church. And God, according to this, supports that that's what this means when it says shall have been bound in heaven and shall have been loosed in on earth and other words when when you do a church discipline know that god is with you on that so god's going to bless the church because of that and notice what he says in verse 20 uh well verse 19 and 20 again i say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything they may ask we're talking about church discipline here it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven, for two or three have gathered together in my name. I am there in their midst. So God is there. And let me tell you something. I've been through church discipline. I've, I've, I've been as a pastor, and I did a terrible job once in doing it. Oh, my gosh. I, I was feeling so badly last night asking that God would undo the damage that I did because of the poor way that I did church discipline. I've also done it properly. Um, and when I've done church discipline, I'm telling you, it's a mess. It's just a mess. And that's in America. Nobody does church discipline. Or not nobody, but very few do church discipline in America. What if a brother is sinning and the church does not follow Jesus' command? Well, that's what happens in, in Corinthians. Here's 1 Corinthians 5. A Christian is living in an incestuous relationship, incest, incestuous relationship with his stepmother. 
I mean, can't be his real mother. I mean, that's beyond comprehension. So it's his stepmother, his father's wife, because that's what it says. It is widely reported that there is sexual immorality among you and the kind of sexual immorality that is not even tolerated among the Gentiles. A man is living with his father's wife. Deuteronomy is very clear about this. Anyway, the, old, the, the Torah is very, very, very clear about this. And um, I, I should have looked up the first, but I didn't. I mean, I've certainly studied it in the past few months. Um, so this, but this in general culture, general culture also says that a man should not be in, in a sexual relationship with his mother-in-law. Oh, no, no, not mother-in-law. Well, that's true too. But with his father's wife. So it's his stepmother. Corinthians apparently did nothing to stop this relationship or to confront it. You have become arrogant. That's really interesting. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who had done this deed might would be removed from your midst. So they didn't remove him. And because they didn't remove him, that shows that they were being arrogant. That's extreme. Arrogant means pr proud. That's really interesting. So, so they're proud. They're not removing him. Whoa, 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 what? How, how would that be? Well, I'm guessing it's because they're not obeying Jesus' command. What to do if a brother sins? They, they become proud as if we don't need to do what Jesus commanded us to do. Okay. They should have mourned. They should have been sorrowful. But they, I think they're doing it. I think they're accepting it. I, I understand this. Uh, I was in a, in a wedding recently between a man and a man. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't a part of the wedding, but I had to be there. It's a long story, but I had to be there. Between a man and a man, they, they got married. A man married a man in a church. In a church. They, they approved it. They should have mourned it. They should have been sorrowful that a man would ever try to marry another man. But instead of being sorrowful about it, they approved it. That's pride. That's when he says, you've become arrogant, you've become proud. Um, and I've not mourned instead. You should have been like, oh, this is the saddest thing I've ever seen. Of course, we're not going to allow this. Instead, they performed the wedding ceremony in the church. Um, instead, they did nothing, which Paul says shows the Corinthians were arrogant. Fusio. In other words, when a church, oh, by the way, that word means puffed up, blown up, thinking you're bigger than you really are. In other words, when a church allows a church member to continue in sin without mourning over it and without following Jesus' command for discipline, this is simply a sign of arrogant pride. I, it, this just gets crazier. It's the same passage, the same chapter. Paul wrote that when the church was assembled, this man was to be delivered over to Satan. For I, the very next verse, for I, on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who committed this as though I were present. And apparently the as though I were present grammatically means as I am present. It's not as though I am present, but I am present. I'm present there in spirit, not in some kind of a spiritual, not, not. It's just because I'm still a part of the congregation, because I still belong to this congregation. Paul's the one who founded the congregation. So that's the idea there. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit, see, he's, he's there. With the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, we know they actually did this because Second Corinthians tells us that, if that's what that's about. Paul is a member of the congregation, even though he is physically absent, yet is spiritually, whoops, spiritually there with them in their church meeting, is pronouncing church discipline on the man. Okay, now, whatever it means to deliver over to Satan, which we're going to talk about in the next slide, um, Paul does this in the name and power of Jesus Christ. This is real. This is not, this is not like an, an imaginary thing. This is real. So, what is hope will happen? That the flesh will be destroyed. The Greek does not say his flesh. I was really surprised to see that because I memorized this. 
um, um, for the destruction of his flesh. And I've always seen that his flesh there. And I assumed that the word his was there. I was really shocked. But it's not there. It's the destruction of the flesh. That his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And the day of the Lord Jesus is talking about when the second coming of Christ, when he stands before the, for Christ. And he has to make an accounting of what he did in the flesh. And Paul wants him to be free from this sin. We'll, come, we'll keep going because you'll see this. Flesh probably means that when it says um, for the destruction of his flesh, it probably means his pride, rebellion, lust, etc., which flesh often means. Often, 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 often in um, the word flesh is used to describe pride or is used to describe rebellion or it's used to describe sin or lust. And so that's what it means here. Probably, almost certainly, doesn't mean that it's going to die. It sounds like that, but probably not. And, and, and first of all, flesh often means, oh my goodness, so often in Paul is talking about what I have here, pride, rebellion, lust, etc. when it talks about flesh. But also, he says that his spirit may be saved. And this is not saying, well, I'm, if, if he's killed, if he dies, that his, he's gonna, his spirit's going to be saved. That's not what it's saying. Okay, I got I to gotta set the, the clock here so I know what time it is. Okay, so 6.21. Give me a sec. I just got to gotta set this clock here. I just got to be able to see what time it is. There we go. That'll just help me to make sure that I don't lose track. All right. There are so many exegetical questions in here. There's a ton of exegetical work that we have to go through in order to get to this point. But what does delivering over Satan mean? Ah, you can do all kinds of stuff with this. Um, I think the answer I'm giving is the right answer. I think it's a, a great answer. And I think it explains... The, the questions that we have about it. So my, is this like what happened in Job 1 and 2? So in Job chapter 1, um, Satan comes and Satan accuses Job and God says he's in your power. And then um, Satan, and look what the Lord says. The Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. So what is God doing? He is putting Job in the power of Satan. Is God punishing Job? No, not at all. Is Job getting demon-possessed? No, not at all. What's happening? God's giving Satan permission. He's putting Satan in, no, putting Job in Satan's power. Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. And God gives Satan very strict instructions of what he can do and what he can't do. Uh, so that, I think, is what's going on um, in this delivering over to Satan in 1 Corinthians. So the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your power, only spares life. That's the second chapter. I think this is like Job's experience. Paul would be asking God to give Satan permission to bring trouble on this to this man so that he would repent. Remember, the point of Paul's action is to save the man. He's not trying to judge the man. He's trying to save him. I've declared to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Remember when we say destruction of his flesh, it's probably talking about pride and rebellion and lust. So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He's not doing this to judge the guy. He's He's not angry at the guy. He's angry at the Corinthians because they haven't done anything. He's trying to save him. So this man's experience would be like David's experience. Um, like Job's experience or like David's experience. Listen to what David says in Psalm 32. For day and night, okay, this is talking about after David sinned with Bathsheba and after he murdered her husband Uriah and the 20 other men who were with Uriah and this is what David's experience was. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. 
My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. And he's talking here about what happened to him after he had committed this murder before he had repented from it. Because the next verse talks about the fact he repented and how good he felt, or maybe not the next verse, but close after this. So, so what's going on in David's experience is the same thing that Paul, I'm thinking that the, what Paul is asking God to do to deliver this guy over to Satan is the same thing as um, what God did to Job. God didn't touch Job. It was Satan who touched Job. And what God did to David, and maybe it was Satan who did that too. And I want you to notice something here. I want you to notice something very important. Um, this thing that Paul is doing, he's doing it in the congregation. Uh, let's go back and look at that. For on, I, in my part, though, absent from the body, but present in spirit. Why? Because he's the guy that founded the church because he's still like an elder of the church. He always will be. Um, he's the apostle. I've already judged him as so committed this as though I were present, as being present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan. Notice, it's in the body. It's not something that Paul does independently. He's doing it the next time they assemble. This is what they're going to do. They're going to obey Paul and they're going to do this. I'll say, the Apostle Paul has commanded that this man be delivered over to the power of Satan. And I want you to notice something here, okay? Almost definitely, the delivering over to the power of Satan, it's not some kind of magical thing or something like that. It's not a demonic thing. Um, but it is allowing, asking God to allow Satan to do what's ever necessary to bring this guy to repentance, okay? But there's a big part of this is he is no longer going to be a part of the body. No one is allowed to associate with him. No one's allowed to talk to him until he repents. Um, and when you do church discipline, I've done this. You say to the person, well, look, we want you to repent. We want you to get free of this. And any time, any time you say, I want, I want to change. You talk to any, any of us as elders and we will work with you and help you and counsel you and walk you through this. So it's not, it's, but as far as the congregation goes, and even as far as the elders go, they're not going to associate with this guy. They're not going to have lunch with him. Paul says, don't even eat with him. We're not going to do that because we have to help this person to overcome the sin. And when Satan does what Satan's going to do, well, we can't be visiting this guy and saying, well, let me, let me just encourage you and pray with you as you go through this difficult time. Yeah, I, I talked to a guy. Um, and he wasn't put under church discipline, but he sure was delivered over to Satan. And everything was going wrong. Everything, everything was going wrong in his life. Everything. He was living in a sexual sin. He was not repenting from the sin. He hated the sin, but he kept on doing it. He didn't stop doing it. He asked for help and um, he went to a, a Christian and said, can you help me in this situation? And, and the Christian said, well, this is what you got to do. You got to break this um, sinful relationship with this woman. And you you got to do it. And he said, I can't. I can't do it. And it was, he was a pastor. And so everything went bad. Every, everything went bad. Everything, I don't know what's happened to him, but everything went bad in his life. Now, here's my point. My point is, that's what it means to be delivered over to Satan. God gives Satan, because God loves the person so much, God gives that, that person over into Satan's hand, the way he gave Job over into Satan's hand. Now, God has his limitations of what Satan is allowed to do, but that's what is going on here. Now, it's very possible that you're going to have all of your questions about that. This is not the important part. The important part is the church discipline part. So when we talk, do questions, I'm only going to spend a couple of minutes on this, no matter what you ask, because the real question is the church discipline. First Corinthians 5, Paul has at least two goals in commanding church discipline. First, as we've already said, Paul wants to save the man who's living in sexual sin. But second, 
Paul is concerned about the impact this man's sin will have on the congregation as a whole. Okay, good. I have my mic. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast permeates the whole batch of dough? Okay, so take it from somebody who makes a lot of bread and makes a lot of pizzas. I'm an expert at using yeast. And most of you don't have ovens, and so you don't do a lot of baking. I do a lot of baking. And so in baking bread, you take a spoonful of yeast, which in our day is powder, but in their day wasn't powder, was probably, yeah, it was probably just um, liquid that had yeast in it probably. Um, yeast is a, it doesn't matter what it is. Okay, you add a spoonful of yeast. Well, that's what we do today. But it was basically the same thing then. <coughs> <coughs> spoonful of yeast to flour and water. So it's flour that's been mixed up with water, like for chapatis. And then within an hour or two, all the flour will have doubled in size. And it's changed because the yeast goes through the whole thing. So when he says a little yeast permeates, the word permeate means spreads through and affects the whole batch of, of dough. Um, not dealing with one man's sin, sexual sin, that's what's happening in 1 Corinthians 5, is they're not dealing with it. They become proud. They're not dealing with it. They think, oh, we're so, we're so open. We don't condemn people because they're living in this thing. We, but not dealing with one man's sexual sin can influence everybody in the church to be lax towards sin. So that wedding I told you I went to, I'm sure that, I'm sure that the, the amount of sexual morality that is probably going on in that church is probably like terrifying. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. You gotta deal with it, you gotta get him out or else he's going to infect the whole church. That's what Paul's worried about. Well, he's, he's also worried, worried about the man. We've already said that. He's worried about the man too. He's worried. He wants him to be saved in the day of Christ. So he's we're very worried about that. But he's also worried about the church. He gives a critical, in, critically important um, principle here. A really surprising principle, okay? Which isn't as big a deal in Pakistan as it, as it is in America. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with covetous or swindlers or with idolaters. For then, you would have to go out of the world. Notice that we may associate with unbelievers, but not be unequally yoked to them. That's a different subject. It would be impossible to live, Paul says, without dealing with the people of the world. However, Paul has strong warnings here about our relationship with people living in sin, who call themselves Christians. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he's an immoral person or a covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. That's pretty strong, not even to eat with such a one. I wrote to you not to associate, not to do anything with that person. Not to do anything with that person not to be friends with that person, not to have that person over for a meal, not to go to that person's house for a meal, not to go to, with that person to a, a restaurant, nothing. You have nothing to do with the person. Okay, so he gives us in this, this list we just looked at, he gives us um, a dis brief description of the kinds of people who must be disciplined by the church. And it's not a complete one, it's a brief description. Actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. Notice, in other words, this is not an idol worshiper who's not even a Christian, but someone who calls himself a Christian or herself a Christian. If he is an immoral person or a covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Sexually immoral, the word poranas. That's interesting. One who practices sexual immorality a fornicator. This can include going to prostitutes, having sexual relations outside of marriage, adultery, 
and in our context, it would include pornography. I mean, the word pornos is the root of the word pornography. So it would be a person who practices sexual immorality, a fornicator, a covetous person, um, one who desires to have more than is due, a greedy person. It's a very good definition of covetousness. I'm going to spend one minute on covetousness. I've already talked about this once in this course, but I'm going to do it again. Coveting is when you want something that you don't need. That's what it means when it says desires have more than is due. It's when you want something that you don't need. Now, we say that we need things, but that's not really true. If you have a phone, and someone else has a nicer phone and you wish you had a nicer phone, you're coveting. You don't need it. Oh yeah, but that phone does this and that phone does that and mine doesn't do it, but you don't need it. You can get along without it. Oh, but you can take such good notes in that phone. You can take notes in just about any phone, but, but you don't need it. You just want it. Whenever you want something that you don't need, that's coveting. And coveting is a sin. Wanting something that you don't need is a sin. So we got a new house and it's really small. It's like, it's as small as a small village house. Um, and it's real small. And in that house, um, it's, it's, it's what we needed. So we bought that this year. And um, it's called a mobile home, but you have to look that up to see what that means. The house next to ours went for sale and it cost almost three times as much as our house, more than twice of what our house costs. But it's a much bigger house and it's on a really a nicer location. It's right next to our house. It's two meters away from our house, three meters away from our house. So it's a really close neighborhood because it's just a small house. And I wanted that house. That's coveting. So I really had to deal with that sin. Wanting something I don't need. Yeah, but I mean, it would give us more room. And it's got such a great view of the, of the, the, the water. We're, our house is right on the water. It's right next to the water. Um, it's like one, it's like three meters away from the water. So I was like, oh, it'd be awesome, dude, because it has a much better view and stuff. But I don't need it. I don't need it. I just want it. Wanting it is coveting. That's coveting. Okay, the next one is an idolater. That one's obvious, a person that worships idol or uses idols. They may not worship idols in the normal sense of worship, but they may use idols. Um, black magic is idolatry. Um, white magic, if that's, there is such a thing, that's idolatry. So um, horoscopes, that's idolatry. Totally, totally is idolatry. That's exactly what idolatry is all about. A reviler is a person who says bad things about others. Uh, there's a lot about that in the New Testament. A drunkard, a person who habitually drinks too much, thus becomes a drunkard. A swindler. This is a weird word. Uh, this word is used um, to describe hungry wolves. Um, this is a person who looks for victims to steal from or, or even worse. Not a, like a robber, I mean, it could be a robber, but it would include robbers, but a person who would also trick people, take money from people, uh, lying to them. This could be a shopkeeper who cheats people. That, that would perfectly fit this word. Um, could very easily be a shopkeeper. Say, say there's somebody in the church, and I had this happen. Say there's somebody in the church who um, is dishonest in the way that person does business. He's a shopkeeper and he cheats people. He gives them really bad quality stuff and he tells them that it's good quality. That's a swindler. That's this word. He's trying to get money like a hungry wolf. He's got his victims. Okay, so this gives us an idea of the kinds of people. Christians are not to judge those who are outside the church. We already saw that. But they are to judge those inside the church. For what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? Don't you judge those who are inside? But God judges outsiders. Put away the evil man. 
person from among yourselves. Does this contradiction contradict what Jesus himself taught about judging? So Christians in, in the West are not doing church discipline anymore. They're not doing what Paul commands here because they're being proud. And the reason they're not doing it is because they say, well, judge not and be not judged. There you go. Jesus said it. Judge not and be not judged. Do not judge so you will not be judged. There it is. People assume this means we must never judge another Christian. But you have to look at the context. Jesus is talking about taking the speck of dust out of the eye of another person. Okay, so why do you look? This is the very next verse. Well, not the very next verse, but it's almost the next verse. Why do you look at the speck uh, that is in your brother's eye that you're judging, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. We're supposed to deal with the other person's eye. It's not like we're supposed to just let him have a speck of dust in his eye. First, though, we have to deal with our own sin, and then we'll be ready for the other. So when Jesus says, do not judge, he is not saying that we should not deal with sin in another person at all. We should take the speck of dust out of the other person's eye. First, we need to deal with, our, with ourselves. So not judging doesn't mean that we don't do church discipline. Jesus is the one who commanded church discipline. We already saw that. If a brother is in a sin, um, this is what you do. So Jesus already commanded that we do this. And so obviously Jesus doesn't contradict himself. But that's because if you look at the context, you realize you are taking a speck of dust. Judging not does not mean ignoring sin. So church discipline should also happen to people who cause divisions or teach bad doctrine. Avoid stupid arguments, long lists of ancestors, quarrels and fights about the law. They're useless and worthless. Give at least two warnings to those who cause divisions and have nothing more to do with them. Whoa. You know that such people are corrupt and they, their sins prove that they are wrong. So if people are causing division in the church, give them two warnings and then remove them from the church, then have nothing to do with them. A person who causes division is probably more than just arguing over unimportant doc doctrines probably also includes a person who divides the church in power struggles. I don't, I don't know how that can include it, a person who causes divisions. Give at least two warnings to those who cause divisions. So if, if somebody causes a division in the church, warn the person. Warn them again, and, and maybe even warn them a third time. And then have nothing to do with them. I, I told you that I went through a, a church split when I was a pastor and they left because of me and I understand why they left and that's fine because I understand that. But once they left, there were people who were writing, there were people who had left their church who were writing people who had stayed in the church and were encouraging them to leave the church. They were being divisive people and they were causing division. And I told the people in our congregation, this is what the scriptures say. You should not be associating with these people. These people are doing the wrong thing in trying to cause a division in the church. Notice what he says. I urge you, my brothers and sisters, watch out for those who cause divisions and upset people's faith and go against the teachings which you heard, which you received. Keep away from them. For those who do such things are not serving Christ our Lord, but their own appetites. By their fine words and flattering speech, they deceive innocent people. Boy, I've experienced this everywhere. I experienced this in Pakistan. I totally have experienced this in Pakistan, where people have told me bad things about other people in the church. I said, oh, that person there, that person really bad. He's evil. He's demonic. He's cruel. He's awful. He's dishonest. And they tell me all this stuff and they're trying to, and they did, they totally did. Influence me against another person. And that's, that's what we're talking about here. That's exactly what we're talking about. 
Upset people's faith means cause people to stumble, which is a serious concern. So I had this experience when I was um, working uh, in a church that somebody who was older start, started coming to the youth group and I wasn't running the youth group and he was bringing doctrine about the Trinity and he was bringing all this stuff about the Trinity. And um, finally, we just had to ask him not to come anymore um, because he was causing the youth to be stumbled in their faith because this guy was really attacking the Trinity. Go against the teaching you received. Go against the apostles' teachings. All right. Got to be careful when you do church. Now, I don't think this is going to happen in Pakistan to do church discipline. I don't. Divisions, yes, that happens. But doing church discipline is really, really, really hard to do. But it could happen, I guess. Brothers, if someone is caught in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual should restore such a person with a gentle spirit watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. Carry out one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Notice that we're dealing with it. We're, we're restoring such a person with a gentle spirit. And restoring a person, we already know that that means that if we go to that person the first time alone, second time with another two or three, one or two people, so the three of us or so, and we confront them again, and then finally we go to the church, that if that person doesn't repent, well, then that person's going to be to us like a, a Gentile on a tax gatherer where we're not going to associate with that person. We've already seen that in Jesus. We saw that in Paul. And we've seen it. It is very clear in Romans. It's very clear in 1 Corinthians. It's very clear in, in Matthew. So we don't associate with that person. We don't even eat with that person. Um, so that's what he's talking about in this passage. But it should always be done with a gentle spirit, which is awesome. And let me tell you, that is hard to do. That's really hard to do. We had a guy who was working with the youth. And he had a really bad temper. Just a super bad temper. This is when I was a pastor. And I loved this guy. And I spent a lot of time with him. But he had a really bad temper. And so what happened? Um, he did something that was wrong and he caused a problem in the church because of it. So I went to him first. He wouldn't listen to, listen to me. So then I and the head elder from our church, the two of us went together and we sat down with him. And he said, I know what you guys are doing. You're taking Matthew 18. You're going to kick me out of the church. And our head elder, who's the wisest man I ever knew, said, oh, no, Dan, we're not going to do that at all. We want to help you. We think you're struggling and we want to help you to overcome this. You should have seen this guy's face, this fellow Dan. His face just completely changed. And by the end of our time together, he was crying. Not crying in shame, but crying because he was dealing with his sin. And um, in the end, I will, I will say heartbreakingly, he ended up leaving the church in anger. Um, I guess a year later. It was, really, it was really heartbreaking. It was really, really heartbreaking. I was very close to this guy, but he ended up leaving the church out of anger because he couldn't deal with his... I've had lots of situations in Pakistan and in, in America where there are people who just are angry and they, they cause a lot of problems. But anyway, that elder this wisest man I ever knew, um, he had a gentle spirit. And a gentle spirit, when we confront sin in a person's life, a gentle spirit will really make a difference. Because people, when they're, when they're sinning, they get angry when people confront their sin. They, they don't like it at all. And they will, they'll get angry and they'll fight back because they're defending themselves. You come to them with a gentle spirit, with love, with compassion. Say, yeah, I, I, I know how hard this is. That often does it. That often opens the door. Those who are carrying out the discipline must continually examine their own lives. Look what he says here. Um, brothers, if someone is, 
is caught in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual should restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. Well, you won't be tempted here. You might be tempted to pride. You might be tempted to anger. You might be tempted by the sin that this person's doing. You got to be careful. You got to make sure that you look to yourself first. And isn't that what Jesus said? He said, you know, let me take that dust out of your eye, but you've got a log in your own eye. You've got a big piece of wood in your eye. You know, you, know, you got to take it out. You got to deal with your own sin first. So that's a part of what, so that you won't be tempted. It's like, you got to examine your own life. And I'm telling you what, Satan is going to tempt, you know, if the elders go to somebody who's living in the sin, somebody won't repent. It's often a sexual sin, but not always for sure. You saw that there were other things. Um, covetousness is one of the things. Um, when you go to that person, the spirit of gentleness, Satan is going to do everything he can to tempt your, the elders or the people that go to this person. He's going to tempt them into sin. Um, so they have to watch themselves carefully. And then notice he says, carry one another's burdens right in this passage about church discipline. And this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So when you're disciplining them, you got to carry their burdens. We avoid church discipline because it's, it's really messy. It, it is. It's messy. Oh my gosh. It's so messy. It's just a mess. But we avoid it because we don't want to have to go through the mess of it. We got to carry people's burdens, which means that we got to confront them. Culture of the first century um, world, the New Testament was much more like Pakistan than the West. Um, it's an honor shame culture in the first century in the Mediterranean world. It's honor shame. It's a culture that has the same kind of family things. Um, so it's, it has a lot of similarities, way more similarities, um, the world that Paul's writing to the world that Jesus sp spoke to, way more similar similarities with Pakistan's culture, with India's culture, than with America's culture or Germany's culture. America, Germany is very individualistic, um, very low emphasis on family, very low emphasis on community. Um, first century world, high emphasis on family, low emphasis on the individual, high emphasis on um, community, very high. But the big difference, I think, is that the churches Paul wrote to were first-generation Christians. The churches that in Pakistan are fifth and sixth-generation Christians. It's got a lot of tradition there. It's got a lot of patterns that have been built up over years. So that means it's going to be much harder to do church discipline in Pakistan than it would be in Paul's churches. Having said that, though, a lot of the same dynamics were there. A lot of the same cultural patterns were there in the first century that we have in Pakistan. All right. I, I want to discuss this. And I want you to um, give me questions and comments and observations. I really, I really want us to, to deal with this. So let's start talking. Yes, Dowd. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, does church discipline also include the guarding of the communion table or the Lord's table? Because I heard a lecture by Mr. Dr. James White. He was arguing for, uh, uh, he was giving a call towards uh, guarding the table of the Lord, which is included according to him in the category of church discipline. So that means if somebody is found in unrepentant sin, then he must not be allowed to partake in the communion. So what is your stance on it? Um, so let's, let's, let's share a screen here. Let's do this. Okay, let's pop over to... I 
next chapter. No, no, not next chapter. No, no I'm not in the right place. So hold a sec. Let me get to. There's a double answer to this. Okay. Okay, so this is First Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 17, I'm giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together, talking about the Lord's Supper here, not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions, that divisions exist among you. And in part, I believe it. So I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. First Corinthians chapters one, two, and three. For there must be factions among you so that those who are approved may become evident among you. When you meet together, therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first. One is hungry and another is drunk. In other words, they're, they're, they're bringing food with them. They're having a koinonia meal, a fellowship meal. When they have the Lord's Supper, and they're bringing food. This is unbelievable. The rich Christians have plenty of food. And the poor Christians are starving. And they're not sharing their food. They're eating right in front of their poor Christian brothers. Right in front of them. And this would never happen in Pakistan. But it does happen here. And so what Paul says is, what? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? So what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? And this I will not praise you. So this is a problem with eating the Lord's table, okay, when they're coming and they are not loving each other, not respecting each other, not caring about each other. So, all right, now let's go further with it. He talks about the Lord's Supper. And we get down to verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. What is an unworthy manner? Well, what's happening? That the people who are rich are bringing food to, the, to, to this, this koinonia meal, and they're eating the food in front of Christians who are starving and not offering them food. They should be sharing their food equally. They're not doing that. Well, this is because it's a class thing. And the Christians who are rich are looking down on the Christians who are poor. It's a class thing. And so what's going on here is Paul says, um, you're, you're, you're eating un, in an unworthy married manner. You're not loving each other. You're divided from each other. The rich people are not treating the poor people properly, but a man must examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread. Examine himself concerning what? Concerning, am I loving my brother? Or am I divided from my brother? Now, if you eat in a manner unworthy of the Lord, if he who drinks, eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. In other words, if you are eating the Lord's Supper, oh my gosh, if you're eating the Lord's Supper, which is, this is my body broken for you, right? This is my, the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. If you're, if you're drinking the cup and you're eating the, 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 the bread, and you're not even realizing that Jesus died for my sins and therefore he died for my brother's sin and therefore I should be in unity with my brother and I should be sharing my food with my brother. I should be loving my brother instead of thinking that I'm better than my brother. If, if you're doing that, you're eating the Lord's Supper badly. And look what it says. For this reason, many among you are sick and weak and a number sleep, are dead. Oh my gosh. Yes, God is disciplining the church. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But I want you to notice here that the judging that's going on, it's not talking about church discipline. It's talking about when I eat the Lord's Supper, I have to make sure that I am loving my brother, that I'm not divided from my brother, that I am eating the Lord's Supper the way Jesus gave the Lord's Supper, dying for the sins of others. So, I empathize with James White. And of course, what he says is true, that we shouldn't have um, the Lord's Supper together. But I don't see that. I, I, and let me explain why in a minute. I'll explain why in just a minute. But that's not what this passage is about. 
This is God disciplining people. And he's disciplining people who need to individually look at themselves to see if they are treating their brothers in the body properly. That's why he says he judges he, if he does not judge the body rightly. In other words, the body of Christ. He's not judging the body of Christ. There's a double entendre, a, a double meaning there. He's also not judging the, 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 the bread right either because the bread shows Jesus' death, dying for others. Well, that's what we should be doing for each other. The rich people should be dying for the poor people. They should be giving all their food to the poor people. So what's going on, I'm talking about in this, this meal together. So he's not judging the body quite rightly and realizing that we are all one and we should be sharing with each other. And so that's, that's where that is. There is no verse in the New Testament that says that we should do that with people who are under church discipline. However, Paul says we're not supposed to associate with those people. The Lord Jesus says those people are to be to us tax gatherers and Gentiles. Therefore, clearly, that person shouldn't even be in the church service. And if a person comes to the church service and they're under the church's discipline, they shouldn't be there. And therefore, they shouldn't be taking the Lord's Supper, either privately or together. We are not even supposed to be eating with people. So my answer would be yes, but why is that person even there at all? Why is the person in the church service? Because they're not supposed to be associating with that person. If that person showed up, you should say, you know, I'm sorry, but you can't fellowship with us because you have committed this sin. So doubt, yes, but I would say indirectly to what White is saying. And the reason I say it's indirectly because there is no chapter or passage that says what he is saying. It, it's, it's not there, but that doesn't mean that he's wrong, but the person shouldn't even be in church at all. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yes, sir. So, okay. But yes. as we know, there is this uh, progression. Uh, we progress our talk. So it takes time if a person is uh, indulged in a sin. That is, first we will talk to him privately, then in the presence of two witnesses, right. and then uh, we may ban him from the church for a temporary period of time. So what right. about that, uh, that period of time in which uh, uh, the talk is being done and a few weeks are being passed. What about that? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is specifically about a related, uh, about the Lord's Supper, it says he should examine himself. It doesn't say the church should examine him. Yes, sir. Nowhere says sir. the church should examine a person. Yes, sir. So uh, that is my hurdle in agreeing with James White because the text is clear that the examination in regard to the communion or the Lord's table is being done by the same individual and not the elders. So is my understanding correct? That's correct. That's exactly correct. I'm a little nervous about James White. He has a lot of opinions and he says things about other people and sometimes i don't think they're accurate he has no problem with it with attacking other people that's not necessarily sinful but some of the things that he says are political when i say political i mean it's the fight within the southern baptists and some of the things he says make me nervous i, I just don't think he's he's got a lot of opinions anyway bus i'm not gonna talk about that shakib Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, my question is here that uh, you said that God himself expects us to lose a person from the church when that person refuses to repent from sin. So I'm saying that uh, on one side, we are saying that uh, the standard of the Christianity uh, is that God teaches us that uh, pray for your enemy. And uh, on the other side, we are saying that if someone is not adopting or carrying on on this principle, so we should have to uh, mean throw him away from the church. So my question is this, you know, that if we will throw him from the church, then who uh, he will become better? Because we, uh, we have a very live example in our church that one young man, he make a lot of mess in the church and we... Uh, help him a lot and personal counseling and whatever we we were uh, supposed to do we did 
our best and uh, at the end you know we just requested him that you know if you don't want to uh, leave your habits then you should have to leave the church so he left wow. the church and today uh, the position of that boy is that he is alcoholic and he is taking all kind of drugs so he is totally absolutely destroyed and why we we took the decision it was just because the church leadership really uh really pressurized us that you should have to say this boy that leave the church that was not our decision I mean our pastor decision so now the position is this that that boy is totally destroyed and uh he's not even following the jesus christ so my question is there that if we will throw someone from the church that then who will help him and who will uh, stand with him and who he can be a better in this world Okay, so he's addicted to drugs, correct? Yes, sir. No, after after when we throw him from the church. Before that, he was not. So before he was only involved in some of the I mean uh, he was only involved in some of the sexual immoral morality, but now uh, he is also involved in drugs and alcohol. So he's worse than before. Right. So how does that fit in with what Paul says about I, when you gather together, deliver such a one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh? How does what Paul says there relate to this young man? I'm asking you. So what I think that uh as we help him and we con uh, the church leadership had the counseling with him personally counseling with him you know so i think that really helped him uh that was the help helping source you know for him to get off from this certain uh company fellowship but it was not successful okay so so i cannot speak to this situation because i don't know the situation and i have i i have i have my i i cannot speak to the situation but i can say this that the whole purpose of church discipline is to restore a person and to protect the congregation it's both and yes i have worked with people who struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled. Some of those people have overcome the struggle and some have not. Uh, on our Thursday lesson, we're gonna talk about something very closely related to this. So I cannot answer that question because I don't know the situation. And so I'm not gonna try. But I would say this, that if it says I deliver somebody over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, it means that he may go through really difficult times. If the church says you cannot fellowship with us, but it has to be someone who's not repentant. But I will tell you that there are some people who repent, do it again, repent, and do it again, repent, and do it again. And the repentance is real. And sometimes the repentance is not real. I don't, I don't think I'm going to say, it. I don't know the situation, so I really can't say. Khurram. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Dr. Bob, uh, I, I was listening to John MacArthur and I heard him saying that uh, uh, God is more interested to save sinners than sinners themselves wants to be saved. And uh, I think that's true uh, when we talk about the love of God. Maybe sometimes it's... Uh, I don't believe that if there is a true repentance, it would come without a fruit. True repentance would never come without a fruit. Fruit can be the change in the life or attitude or behavior, or it can be the evidence of that salvation that worked out in that brother and sister's heart. So I think sometimes uh, when we, I think when we act upon God's word, 
whatever Shakib was saying, it's not always easy. Sometimes in the leadership, we have to take very tough decisions. Sometimes even more than our emotions, we have to follow the word of God. But we believe that if we obey the God's word, the ultimate result, God knows. Who knows that this guy gets saved at the end of the day? Who knows that he comes back to the Lord? Or uh, it, at times it is very difficult. I've been, I've, I've, I've done a pastoral work and I know it's, it's tough uh, to make such decisions. Secondly, uh, Dr. Bob, uh, I have a question regarding the, the, the Holy Communion that I have a couple of friends who are pastors and they have good church, like a lot of people there in the church and, and they are going fine with their Bible studies and preaching, teaching going on. They are okay with the children taking the Holy Communion or be participating in the Holy Communion. And when I ask them that, because the text is not, text is little quiet on it, when we read the text in Corinthians, it doesn't say that the family should be included, adults, youth, young age, children, who. So uh, I don't know what should be assumed by that in the silence of the text. But uh, they say that if Jesus can die for everyone, then why not his body and blood can be distributed among everyone? That was their stance on that. So what, what do you say? What, what do you say about it? And how do you see it? Like... Uh, some people say that children do not know the story behind it. They don't know the theology of the Holy Communion. At the John Wesley call it the heavenly pledge. And they don't know what happened, who did it and all. Though as a Christian parents, we teach our kids. But should the children be included in it or not? Well, the biblical theology of the Lord's Supper is just super, super interesting. It, 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 it sort of fits this course, but um, if, I, if I start going that direction, I guess I'll be doing that for the rest of the week. Um, I just can't think that you're sinning by allowing children who are old enough to understand that Jesus died for them. Let, come on, let's face it. I don't understand what it means that Jesus died for me, right? So if a child has a, has a simpler understanding, that child's simple understanding may be just totally right. So what age? I don't know. I don't know. How old can a child understand that Jesus died for them? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think it's as big a problem. But I'm not going to answer any more than that because I don't want to talk about the Lord's Supper today. We have enough to talk about what we're talking about what you said your first set of comments was also very good so i'm going to not answer that scenario sir i have a comment and question okay courageousness so um first of all i think it's it's a challenge for um all of us and i would just talk in uh, for me as a person that i think it's very a normal behavior. It has become a very normal part of our life to uh, when we have things that we need, but sometimes we go for things that we want, like we, we may not need, but we want. Oh, and of we, course, right. Yeah, and, and, and we treat like, um, it's, it has become normal for people. And I think nobody even thinks in this direction that it's, um, it's, Witnessness or it's a sin, and 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 my question is that um, if we um, see like how can we help someone if somebody is being um, is towards witnessness because I think this is it's very difficult. Um, just an example that I I have a friend and she um, she. Um, she got like already they have like a very big um, comfortable home but they actually went to buy a more like a luxury um, home and and stuff like that so I was having a conversation with her so um, I I was just trying to explain her that she didn't need that and they already had it and that many they can use for somebody who need or stuff like that. so she um she she told me to be a practical Christian 
and think practical, practically and everybody um, like deserve such things and you should always move on to good, to more good things and everybody deserves that. So how can we um, help people to understand this, what Bible teaches about them? Okay, so first of all, let's let's start. Well, we're dealing with church discipline here, so I don't want to talk about covetousness in general. So I'm going to talk specifically about a person who is a covetous man. So a person who is a covetous man is a person whose lifestyle is driven by always wanting what he doesn't have. And it says covetous person. So, but the person that you're describing is not the person that Paul's describing. That's not a church discipline thing. I have an example in real life of somebody like this. This was a person who was a member of our church when I was a pastor, and I liked him a lot. And he was constantly trying to find a new way to make money. He was constantly trying to do this, constantly trying to do that. And one time I went with him, I sat down with him with one of our um, church members. And I said to him, look, why do you keep on trying to, you're always trying to hit it rich. You're always trying to do this. Why don't you just get a job? Just get a job and work, like work with your hands. And, and the guy that I was with had a great job, but it was, it was a, it was a, it was a job where he, he had to work with his hands and it was a hard work, but I said, stop because this, this fellow I'm talking about the, we want to talk to about it. He would, he actually did things that were kind of like illegal kinds of things and some, some kind of questionable things, but he was always trying to just make, make a big, what we would say in America is make a big killing where we'd make a lot of money and he would be rich. But I don't know if it was happened now, but it certainly didn't happen. He, he moved away, but it certainly didn't happen when he was there. And um, that's the kind of person we're talking about, not the person you're talking about. It's somebody who is so driven by his desire for more, for more, for better, for more, for better, that he makes life decisions that are not godly decisions. So that's what we're talking about. So I don't want to deal with your question. And the reason I want to deal with your question is because that's another that's another thing that we could pursue and talk about for 20 minutes. And um, it's not about church discipline. Church discipline, I have actually had an experience with a covetous man. By the way, we did a terrible job of it, but we did church discipline on that man. And we did it very badly, and it didn't end up good. Oh, my gosh. I feel so guilty about that even now. And it was like 30 years ago. Okay, Zishan. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, sir, I have uh, two questions. Okay. And uh, one is that uh, uh, it is written, sir, in Second Peter, in chapter 3, that God is not willing for any to perish, but all should come to repentance. Mm -hmm. And But uh, if we see uh, the instruction of, of Paul that uh, he instructed to deliver a person to the Satan. So, if God is saying that uh, that He is not willing for anyone to perish, if we deliver a person to a Satan that uh, He don't have a guidance of the Holy Spirit, then how can He repent? Then He can come back to the God one more time. Okay. So, is that your question? Are you done with your question? Yeah, it says this is the first question, sir. All right. So, um. Book of Job, all right? I use Book of Job in my example. When God said to Satan, he is in your power, only do not touch his body, all right? What was God doing? God was delivering him over to Satan. Job did not know God personally. Not, yeah, Job did not know God personally. Job only knew God through what other people said. All right. So what happens in the story of Job? That story of Job. Um, I'm having a hard time hearing because there's a lot of background noise. Could you turn off your sound, please? Thank you. So, um, so in the in the story of Job, God 
Job didn't know God personally. He only knew God from what other people told him. Uh, we know that from the end of Job. So my point is that God wanted to destroy Job's flesh so that Job could know him personally. That's what we're talking about. So we're talking about that God would bring a person into that situation. Okay, go ahead. Yes, sir. And this is second question is that, uh, uh, is the Paul instruction regarding deliver a person to, uh, to, a, uh, to a Satan, is it applicable to a church member or it is applicable to the management of the church or uh, the leadership also? If it is applicable to le leadership, then who is the person who has authority to accuse a pastor or leader or uh, deliver that person to a Satan? All right, so if you look at the passage, Paul says um, that he's going to be in their midst. And he said, I am delivering this person over in your midst. And it sounds to me like what he is saying is this church discipline that's happening is something that is congregational. It's the congregation that decides. Yes, it's the elders. But remember what Jesus said. If he will not listen to you personally, Go with two or three other people. If he won't listen to them, bring it to the church. If he won't listen to even the church. So the church is more than just the elders. The church is the congregation. And so this is a congregational thing. This is not, oh, I'm going to deliver this person over to Satan in my prayer time. No. Although you can pray that. You can pray that. Um, certainly people have prayed that for their children who have gone astray and are living in drugs or whatever, you'll pray, God, do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes, Lord, to bring him back to you. You can pray that, but this is a congregational thing. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Sure. Yakub. I want to uh, ask uh, about... Uh, uh, the situation sometimes people are uh, attending to the word of god they listen here but uh, the, for the uh, for the holy communion they refuse or uh, do we think that uh, refusal is also a sin uh, like uh, that uh, that the other uh, other Whoops, you, you muted yourself. You're muted. I can't hear you. Talk again. Unmute yourself, Yakub. There, there is an understanding that uh, people normally attend the church, but they, they refuse to receive the Holy Communion. And uh, in that sense, uh, they think that sometimes maybe they are not prepared, they are not ready. So, for this purpose, I understand that the Word of God and uh, the Holy Communion are just the same. If somebody is uh, receiving the Word of God, he can receive the Holy Communion. Is there any specific uh, difference that uh, people are able to receive the Word of God normally, but uh, refusing the Holy Communion? How can we clarify this? Okay, so that so. So I understand why people wouldn't take communion, sort of. <coughs> I, because the, what does it say? It says if anyone eats the Lord's Supper wrongly, um, he's, he's responsible before God. And so they might be afraid um, because of bad teaching. I agree with you that, and this is what Luther would say, is communion is grace. The only reason why you shouldn't eat the Lord's Supper is if there's something that's dividing you between you and somebody else. Although Jesus is not talking about the Lord's Supper when Jesus, but Jesus does say that if you go to present your offering on the altar and you have something against your brother, go and make it right with your brother first and then go to the altar. Now, that's not the Lord's Supper. That's not the altar of the Lord's Supper. There is no such thing as the altar of the Lord's Supper. But I think that the general principle is there. That yes, if I do not, if I have division between me and somebody else, then I should make that right first. Now, grace, the Lord's Supper is grace. It's a picture of grace. It is grace. So 
you eat in grace, but if you're divided, I mean, that's what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 11 is division. It's, there, there are people, there are rich people who are looking down on poor people and they're not walking in proper fellowship with them. And if that's the case, don't take the Lord's Supper until you've made it right, but make it right. You've got to make it right. If people say, well, you know, I'm not, I haven't spoken to my sister in 20 years. I can't take the Lord's Supper. Speak to your sister. Mm, yes. That's Paul's answer. Speak to your sister. Fix the problem. Bridge the gap. Make it right. Mm. So mm. don't say, oh, I'm not going to eat the Lord's Supper for the rest of my life because I'm never going to be re reunited to my sister. Well, guess what? Jesus said that a person who refuses to forgive his brother or sister is going to hell. Mm, yes. And so, so that is something that needs to be dealt with. The Lord's Supper is just a place where we say, I can't continue to have this hatred towards my sister and mm. take the Lord's Supper. I need to deal with my relationship with my sister. I'm serious. Mm. This is a serious mm. thing. And so God does not expect us to have this continue. Did that sort of speak to what you're saying a little bit? Yes, yes, thanks. Okay, Zanaria? Sir, I just have a follow-up observation on what I said before. Um, am I correct somewhere, like, in, in the church? Like, I witnessed in, in churches that um, it's just basically like what we call the um, first power to gospel, where it is being... Um, preached actually and taught that um, to um, test or evaluate God's blessings if you get uh, more and more and like good things, God blesses you with the good things um, in terms of money or material or cars. And this is a kind of mindset among people that if they have a small car, but if next year or like if they got a big luxury car, it means that God, God is adding um, blessings to their life and God is happy with them. And they're standing in a very good relationship with God. This is how they um, see that. And this is what is being preached um, in some like um, churches, like in the churches. So how, how do we do, deal with this situation? Does it, um, does it come in some sort of, um, promoting like maybe unknowingly or indirectly promoting um, this covetousness that of um, how people um, think that it's it's very good thing to have. Um, it's not, I think like um, what I'm trying to say that it never give people a chance to um, think that they should be uh, should not uh, look for wanting but needs. So it's kind of becoming normal. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to, I. this is not really the subject of this lecture. So I'm just going to say, and this is a question that you asked last time too. So I'm just going to say that um, there are two parts of this. One is love. Okay, so the, and contentment. So contentment is a part of love as far as our relationship with God goes. Contentment is a part of love as far as our relationship with God goes. And so we are contented with what God gives us. We're satisfied with that. Um, prosperity gospel encouraged people to be discontent. They actually literally do that. They encourage people to lust and covet. They actually do that. That's, that's real. That's a real part of prosperity gospel is to encourage people to covet. That's, that's just a part of what they do. And that's clearly not being contented. Paul says godliness is a great, is a, it means a great gain if accompanied with contentment, for we brought nothing into this world and we'll take nothing out of it. But if a person is contented, okay, that's the key. The key is to be glad with what God has given you. And that means that I'm not coveting what God hasn't given me. Now, if I need food and covering, if, if that's what I need, that's right. And I can say, God, please give me food and please give me coveting. But if I say, God, please give me better food. I don't like this food. It's not good enough for me. I would like something that's more enjoyable. And all I've gotten is what God's given. That's 
discontent. And so loving God means I'm going to be contented. And so I don't really want to talk about content, about, about this thing about coveting anymore, because it's not really what we're talking about. But the, the, the solution to coveting is both love and contentment. Contentment means not forced contentment, but it means because God is good and God knows what's best for me and I want what he wants. And I shouldn't, we, ha we have to speak about, we have to speak about um, prosperity gospel because it's a poison that causes people to be discontented with what God has given them. But I don't know. You can deal with prosperity gospel really nicely without ever mentioning it over four or five or six years by encouraging people to trust God and to see God's goodness. Okay. Now, I am hoping with all of my heart that you all have looked at this. And here is this schedule. And you've noticed that there's yellow and green and kind of a gray blue and orange and what in America we call turquoise. And there you go. There are these colors. And um, then there's this color, which I don't know what color this is. We would, we would call it peach. Um, <coughs> and these colors here are, this is the first <coughs> outline, which is due on Wednesday, and this, here's the first outline, which is due on Wednesday. Second outline, this is this green, and that's going to be due the following Tuesday, etc. Okay, so you can see that, so just keep that in front of you. And then down here, on the 18th of August, oh, yeah, that's right, I, I need to Oh, well, let's do this. On the 18th of August, um, we're not having <clears throat> formal class. And so I put two, <clears throat> I put some, some stuff for you to do. So <clears throat> I've got this here. This is my introduction to it, which is short. This is a John MacArthur message. And here's the message here. And then if you go here, it has, it, it's written out. It's the text of it. So you'll want to do that. And then we have the same thing on the next day, Thursday. I've got <clears throat> my introduction to it. And then I've got four videos about sexual purity. And that's what you're going to do. Okay. <clears throat> so any questions about this? Uh, Dr. Uh, Bob, would you be able to send me the links on Google Drive? For right. This? Yes. I will do that if you send me an email. Okay. Sure, I'll then I'll remember to do it. Yeah. Great All question. Right. Uh, sir, any I other questions? Yes. yes sir. I just want to know that uh, the outline, uh, uh, the first outline due date is tomorrow. So maybe uh, it, that we will not have uh, the internet connection tomorrow until 12 uh, p.m. p.m. Sorry, tomorrow. What about today? Do you have internet connection today? Yes. Opportunities right there. Do it today. Okay. Zubberdust. So Yes. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? My experience last, not last year, but before in the past has been usually they don't start blocking mobiles until like noon. Maybe I'm wrong, but my experience has been in, in the morning. So do it today and do it tomorrow morning, but do it today. Yeah, so they will uh, suspend the services at six 
a.m. tomorrow. Okay. Then what yeah, you need to do? Twelve. Yes. You just need to stay up until six in the morning and get it done. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Well, well, well. There we go. So lots of lots of interesting stuff. So um, tomorrow's Wednesday and Thursday. So tomorrow you'll do your best. If you have any questions about what you're watching or something, let, let me know. Um, and I'll help in any way I can. Uh, you know what? We do have a problem because of this. I don't know what to do about it. My problem, Shakib, my problem with changing the deadline is I don't want to change the deadline for the next outline. That's my problem. If I push that further, that's my problem. So this is what I'm going to do. The lecture for tomorrow and the lecture for Thursday. You can, you can watch those anytime. You can, you can watch those anytime, right? Those, 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 you just have to have them done in order for your, your outline for that subject, right? Yeah. So that's all, that's all you need to do. Sir, so don't worry. Really, yeah. Go ahead. It will be, it will be really great, you know, that if uh, from, because the deadline for this is 12 a.m. tomorrow, 12 a.m. So it will be great that if you extend it till uh, the 6 a.m., you know, for the- No, you day. could get it done today. You can definitely, okay. you definitely okay. have enough time to get it done today. So I do not want to extend it because then I have to extend the next deadline, deadline and I have to extend the deadline after that and I have to extend the deadline after that. So there are sure, five sure, assignments no that are affected by doing this. So I don't want to do that. So you just have to get it done today. You could have done it yesterday. Okay, I'm done. So um, I appreciate what you said, but I just don't. What I'm saying is don't worry about the John MacArthur message and don't worry about the other message until you've got this assignment done. So that's what I'm saying. So you don't need to do the John MacArthur and the other assignment today. Okay, God bless you all. And you have a great day and stay safe and healthy. And I'm going to get going. Okay. Okay, sir. Take care. Bye-bye.